Sensational cases have a tendency to divide public opinion and sometimes even spills into politics and today's case is one just like that. It's one that leaves a family devastated and broken and the innocence of the only survivor forever up for debate. The family in today's case is the Bain family. Robin Irving Bain and Margaret Arawa Bain were from Dunedin, New Zealand. Robin and Margaret married in 1969 and only three years later they welcomed the first addition to their family. David was born first, followed by his sisters, Arawa and Laniet, in 1974 and 1976, and then his brother Stephen in 1980. David was the only one born in Dunedin because in 1974 the family moved to Papua New Guinea, where Robin had found work as a missionary teacher and teaching was something that stayed with Robin for the rest of his life. The Baines stayed in Papua New Guinea for eight more years, welcoming the final members of their family along the way before they moved back to New Zealand. There, Robin became the head teacher of Tayeri Beach School, and in 1994, the Baines moved into what would be their forever home. As picture perfect as this may sound, the reality was anything but. The Baines' house in Anderson's Bay was old, in some places even falling to pieces, and the way the family looked after it didn't help matters either. Most of the rooms were filled with the family's possessions, not neatly or even safely stashed away, but in big piles scattered throughout the house. But that was only one part of the Bain's life that had fallen apart. Robin and Margaret were not on good terms. Now far from being the wife of a missionary teacher, Margaret found herself a devout believer of New Age spiritualism, and that wasn't the only thing about her that had changed. She barely spoke to Robin, and when she did, all they seemed to do was fight. She both called him to his face and referred to him to others as Belial, one of the crown princes of hell from the Bible, and she wasn't shy about what she wanted to do to him either. Margaret often told people, including her neighbours, that she'd shoot Robin if she had the chance, and it was no secret that Robin wasn't allowed in the house. During the weekdays, Robin would sleep in the back of his van near the Tayeri Beach School, and when he came home on the weekends, he slept in a caravan in the garden. So things had noticeably taken quite a dive at the Bain household. When it came to the children who were just trying to get by while all of this was going on, the eldest son, David, was studying music at Otago University and had a part-time job delivering newspapers to help support himself. Arawa was studying to become a teacher at a local teacher's training college, and Stephen was in high school. Perhaps taking pity on the way her father was forced to live, Laniet, the youngest daughter, who was still only 18 at the time, had started living with her father in the back of his van near the school. And by then, David was noticeably struggling. His colleagues claimed that he seemed deeply depressed and struggling to cope with everything that was happening around him. Maybe that was why Laniot called a family meeting on the evening of the 19th of June 1994. Or perhaps she had a different reason entirely, to want to speak with her family. And maybe there was more to the sudden and drastic changes in Margaret's behaviour towards Robin. According to later witnesses, Laniot had gone to the family meeting to tell the rest of her family that Robin had been raping her. Some reports simply called it incest, some called it rape, but either way, what allegedly happened between a father and daughter and the power dynamics would have been skewed. If this report was indeed true, who knew how long Robin had been abusing his daughter, and if Margaret had known something about it, and that was what she was trying to do to keep her husband out of the house. And who knows exactly what was said in the meeting that evening, but what we do know for sure was that the Bain family became nationally and probably internationally known only 24 hours later. On the morning of the 20th, David got up as he usually did to do his morning paper run. He didn't notice anything unusual around the house, but by the time he'd come home around 7 o'clock that morning, his whole world had fallen apart. Moments later, he was on the phone to the police, telling them, They're all dead. They're all dead. 
Robin, Margaret, Arawa, Laniot and Stephen, who was only 17 years old, had all been shot to death during the time it had taken David to complete his paper route. Robin was the only one found near the gun, with the weapon lying on the ground just beside him, but the only other clue as to who had possibly done this and why was a typed out message on the family computer that simply read, sorry, you are the only one who deserved to stay. The Bain family murders sent the neighbourhood and whole country into shock, but they were all shocked again only four days later when David himself was arrested and charged with five counts of murder. The prosecution actually ended up providing enough evidence against David for his trial to last three full weeks. They argued that David had first shot his mother and his siblings before going out on his paper route, trying to give himself an alibi. He then came home, typed the message on the computer and waited. The only one left was Robin, but he'd been outside, sleeping in the caravan, and when he came back into the house to find the rest of his family murdered, David shot him in the head. To try to cover up his crimes, David had then called the police, pretending to have just walked in and found everyone else in the house deceased. David's lawyers launched a quick defence, saying that it had actually been Robin who'd shot and killed the rest of the family before leaving David the note and killing himself. A lot of this defence rested on a witness named Dean Cottle, who'd been called to appear in court to testify about the relationship between Robert and Laniot. The defence argued that Robin had done this because he'd been both struggling with his mental health, as his former colleagues could attest to, and because he was worried about what would happen when news broke about what he'd done to Laniot. The theory was pretty sound, and surely something that would have swayed some of these jury members, but there was a catch. Dean Cottle did not show up to court. Instead, he wrote a letter explaining what he knew about the Bain family, and the judge threw it out. The judge found Dean to be an unreliable witness and banned any of his testimony from being used in court. David was essentially left without any solid defence, but the prosecution also lacked motive. Robin would have had a clear motive for wanting to make sure that no one outside the family found out what he had done, but David had no foreseeable reason for wanting his family dead. But then the prosecution claimed that they had found a reason. David had been pushed to do what he had done, not because of anything to do with Robin and Laniot, but because he and his father had a long-standing argument over a chainsaw. The chainsaw had been the reason behind so many jabs and tiffs between the father and son until finally on the morning of the 20th, David snapped and ended up shooting his entire family, leaving himself as the sole survivor. The jury agreed and David was found guilty of five charges of murder. He was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum of 16 years served before he would be eligible for parole. From the day he was arrested, David's case split the nation. Some people viewed him as a callous and merciless killer who'd murdered the people closest to him. Others viewed him as yet another victim of this sad case that had left no one in the family unharmed. Former All Blacks player Joe Caram was one of those people. After reading about the evidence that had led to David's conviction, Joe felt like he had to help him. He spent a lot of time visiting David in prison and wrote four books arguing that David was innocent and he began using the money, fame and resources he had to push for a retrial. His efforts paid off, however, when he managed to gain David's case enough publicity that a retrial was scheduled for 2009. According to some reports, the fighting for a retrial cost Joel Karam millions of dollars and his relationship with his girlfriend. Joe never said how much he actually spent fighting for David, but it's not hard to imagine that it truly was exceptionally expensive when you consider that Joe and David's legal team had to go all the way to the Privy Council in London to get it. They presented the Privy Council with the evidence they had to prove that David was innocent, much of it centering around Robin and his documented decline in mental health around the times of the murders, and the Privy Council agreed with them. They ordered that the Australian courts give David a retrial, saying that the evidence, quote, compels the conclusion that a substantial miscarriage of justice has actually occurred in this case. 
David was released on bail pending his trial, having already served 13 years of his minimum 16-year sentence. This time, the trial lasted three months, but it took the jury less than a day to find David not guilty on any of the charges. The first thing David did with his freedom was to go on a three-month vacation to Europe, courtesy of the people who'd believed in his innocence, but it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows after that. The trial had put his name back in the papers, and it had reminded the public of what he'd been accused of in the first place. When he returned to New Zealand, David struggled to find work, with most employers nervous about hiring someone who'd been convicted for murdering their own family, even if he had later been acquitted. This must have gotten David thinking though, and with many people still treating him like he'd done something wrong, he looked to the people who'd put him in that position to begin with. He filed a case against the government, suing for wrongful imprisonment, but the compensation aside, what it would do was officially clear his name in the public eye. If the government paid, they'd essentially be admitting that they'd imprisoned the wrong man, not just that they couldn't prove that David had killed his family. Thinking that he wouldn't be able to find an impartial judge to oversee this case, the then Minister of Justice, Simon Power, asked a retired Canadian Supreme Court Justice, Ian Binney, to do it. Judge Binney took a whole year to look over the details and eventually came back to say that he believed that David should be paid compensation for the time he'd had to serve behind bars. That sounded clear enough, but by the time Judge Binney came back with his verdict, Simon Power had retired, and all Judge Binney was doing then was telling unsympathetic ears that they had to pay out. His verdict further divided opinions, this time not amongst the public, but amongst politicians. Some argued that Judge Binney had made several errors when making his verdict, and the new Justice Minister, Judith Collins, agreed. Judith Collins commissioned a new report to weigh up David's case, and this led to a very public argument between Judith Collins and Judge Binney. Judith Collins criticised and dismissed the evidence in Binney's report, and Judge Binney ended up publicly stating that the government were, quote, shopping around for a biased report that would let them get out of having to pay David. Years went by with no movement on the case, but it all began once again when David filed a complaint against Judith to the High Court. Judith Collins actually ended up resigning shortly after, when more of her behind-the-scenes activities were revealed in Nikki Hager's book, Dirty Politics. Amy Adams was then appointed as the new Justice Minister, and a new report on David's case was commissioned, this time with an Australian judge named Ian Cullinan. Just over a year later, Adams revealed that Judge Cullinan had found that David was not actually innocent of his charges. He cited the fact that blood spatter found on Robin's body didn't actually match with a suicide, and the fact that the footprints found at the scene could no longer be examined because the police had burnt the house down only two weeks after the murders. It looked like David was back to the very beginning, but Cullinan's findings wouldn't actually lead to a retrial. They only meant that the government wasn't liable to pay David any compensation for wrongful imprisonment because David was actually guilty. David and his defence team obviously disagreed and already got the wheels in motion to contest this latest report. Seeing this and knowing that it was about to lead to another lengthy court case, the government offered David a payment of $925,000 on the condition that the court cases came to a stop. David agreed. He got something for his time, although by doing it this way, the government never actually admitted that he'd been wrongfully imprisoned or accepted responsibility for doing it. The only thing they did admit to was that they were through trying to fight legal battles with David Bain, and David must have been through with them too. By the time of Judge Benny's report, an overwhelming majority of the public believed that David should be compensated. The public opinion stayed even when Judge Cullinan's findings were announced. He may have formally been acquitted of his charges, but it looks like David and his reputation will forever be tied to the events of that morning back in 1994, but the opinion on whether he deserves anything he got after it will probably never be settled one way or another. Thank you.